Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and happy Friday. I'm Tracy B. Wilson. And I'm Holly Fry. Uh, One of our episodes this week was on Annie Jump Cannon, who uh, I put on the list, as I said in the episode, when we did the episode on Cecilia Pankaposhkin. That's not the only episode she has come up in, though. She was also specifically mentioned in the episode about uh, NASA engineer and mathematician Mary Jackson, Mm -hmm. and her name has come up in a lot of other research on other episodes, but not made its way into the actual episode. So imagine my shock when I got ready to start the research on this episode and found that nobody has written a full-length biography of her, a thing that I was 100% confident would have existed already. Right. You would think, considering how prolific and important and iconic she's been, that there would be several to choose from. Yeah, there were none to choose from. And so I wound up relying on sources that Especially if I'm doing an episode on a person and there is, uh, you know, either we we have several book-length biographies to choose from or there's just a lot of more personal biographical information out there. Uh, a, A lot of times I just feel like I have this embarrassment of riches in terms of learning about them and their life and their personality and who they are. This time I read a lot of obituaries There were a lot of obituaries of her, some of which were written by other astronomers. And I felt like that gave me the most human glimpse of her in a lot of cases. And I still am surprised that um, while there are plenty of books that talk significantly about her contributions and in some cases uh, pieces of her life, like I'm still surprised there's not a biography of her, you know, as a a book length for adults piece of work. Yeah, that is very surprising. There's a lot of her stuff in the Harvard archive, though. (laughs) (laughs) Whenever we do any of these topics of uh, women astronomers, and particularly, I mean, it's almost impossible not to note the disparity in how they were treated compared to male colleagues. Uh, But I always find myself thinking of Caroline Herschel and what she would make of this whole business. Yeah. Who, as as listeners will recall, was the sister of William Herschel and also discovered many things in astronomy and did a lot of cataloging of her own uh, many, many, many years before all of this. So that's another for the time travel machine to go Mm -hmm. back and go, Caroline, look. (laughs) (laughs) Look what's happening. There were a lot of papers written in the late 19th century that were specifically about quote, women's work mm-hmm. in science and in astronomy, in specific fields of sciences. Um, and a lot of these were really focused on the record keeping and the organization and the, like, the the computer work when computer was a job title that a person would hold rather than an object that you would type on. Like, there was just, there was a lot of writing about this. This was just a very... Uh, well-established idea by the time that Annie Jump Cannon came into the field with just a whole volume of uh, of research on it. A lot of it written by women about the work that they were doing and the work that they were supervising. Right. I also wonder when we were talking about, um, you know, her endowment of her award, I I wonder, and I, I'm literally talking off the top of my head, so I haven't done any looking into this, and it may be something that's being addressed and considered and, and figured out. I'm wondering how many awards like that that have been established for women are evolving in a, a world where we recognize, like, non-binary gender. Oh, sure. Um, and more fluidity in in sex and gender. And so um, I'm I'm just wondering how those are evolving. That's a cool thing to consider and, and look for as things go forward. Yeah, I did look to see whether that award is still being granted, uh, which it is. I did not look really at the eligibility requirements of it beyond the fact that it's within five years of earning a PhD. Um, so yeah, yeah. I know there are awards that are kind of broadening that focus a bit. Yeah. Always fascinating to me. 
um, and an important part of our evolving world as we talk about how kind of frustrating some of these things are to read about in relation to how women were treated. I am sure similarly in another 50 years or Mm -hmm. whatever, we will similarly look back and be like, well, that binary thing was problematic. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, another thing that I didn't really get into as much in the episode, um, a, a couple of the pieces that I read that were related to all of this uh, remarked that given the state of accessibility and disability rights at the time, it was surprising to a lot of people that there were two women who had some degree of, of hearing loss, um, both of them generally described as deaf, working at Harvard at the same time, to the point that people have been like, was there some kind of effort at Harvard to intentionally hire people? uh, Or was this just a coincidence? And one of the things that I read speculated that uh, one of the rooms that they were working in had been arranged in a circle so that everyone could see each other's lips as they were talking. And and the reason that I didn't get into this is that every picture that I saw of a workspace at the Harvard College Observatory where women were working, they were all at desks, not not facing in a circle. And so I just... (laughs) I couldn't I couldn't figure out like what specifically was being discussed uh whether that was just you know maybe a lecture hall that I that wasn't shown in the pictures or exactly what was going on there um that also was one of the things that I found uh frustrating by the absence of you know a thorough biography of her is really not knowing more about how this was affecting her and, like, what kind of adaptations, if any, like, was there any attempt at accessibility being made at the observatory? A lot of unanswered questions there. Right. It seems like if there were any any efforts being made, they weren't well documented. It was probably more like a, hey, this might work if there was even something. So we yeah. don't, we don't have hard info. Yeah, and she was a journaler in her adult life, so it's possible that there's references to all this in her journals that are in the archive at Harvard. But again, like, that uh, requires a person to go through all the journals. Right. (laughs) And make a a publicly accessible, published work out of them, which, as of this moment, uh, there's not really. There are some, like, blog posts from various libraries and archives at Harvard that, you know, talk about individual pieces from her diaries and her papers and stuff like that. But there's not, like, a big comprehensive uh, exploration of all of it. Yeah. So, anyway, that is further work to be done. I'm so glad you did her, because she's one that, uh, you know, I have wanted to learn more about for sure. Uh, And is... uh, often not given her due in the the wider realm of people knowing about uh, astronomy's various developments in the 20th century. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I feel a little guilty messing up the Happy Friday would talk about a very sad story, but that's how history works. Yeah, uh, we talked this week about Mildred Fish Harnack and her involvement in resisting the Nazis in Germany, um, and how that is kind of unusual since she was one of the few Americans that was actively involved in that. That was actually there in Berlin when all of that was happening. Um, I was so drawn to her story by how it was rewritten after her death. Yeah, and how for a long time we really only had the words of people who had no vested interest in, like, caring caring about her legacy to go on. Um, and how thankful I am that so many writers and researchers, you know, in what's become, like, a, a multinational effort to really uncover as much information as they can, unpack the the reality versus these propaganda efforts, to try to really put the picture back together in a more truthful and clear way, uh, that to me makes it a very compelling story. And also, you know, a good thing where you remember to question things that come your way in terms of media literacy, because oftentimes people have an agenda of what they're 
what they're sharing and telling you. And um, so, you know, in her case, I mean, I think about how hard it had to have been to visit the U.S. and have everyone presume she was a Nazi and be like, sure. Yeah, it's come up previously on the show several times uh, about people having to join the the Nazi party because that was, like, the option. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Not something that could... I mean, it was something that could be refused at enormous risk to your own life. Right. I don't think we have really talked about, uh, at least in terms of your and my time as hosts, people who were who joined the Nazi party because of that pragmatic need to to do it, but then also were actively working against the Nazi party. We've talked more about, like, people who joined the Nazi party and then they were, like, a professor who, right. uh, you know, was not trying to support the Nazi party's regime, but also weren't actively working against them in this way. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's no way they could have gotten the information that they got, particularly through Arvid's job, Mm -hmm. you know, which was really high-level information about, um, you know, all of the companies involved and the various contracts that were being sent to companies to to make war material. And, you know, they never would have had that information um, had they not done that. They just wouldn't have had access to any of that. So it's an interesting one. That I don't think I could live like that. I could clearly not be a spy, right? Like I can't, I could, I couldn't live like that. I'm like, no, I'm not really a Nazi. I swear, I swear, I swear. I'd get some, you know, magical shirt that says "not really." Um, mm-hmm. But <laughs> uh, it, I mean, it's one of those things that engenders incredible respect on on my part for them and their dedication. Particularly considering that she had a way out that she didn't take when Arvid bought her that that ticket to go home. Um, it's, it's good to know that now she's sort of like Wisconsin's hometown hero, home state hero is a better mm-hmm. way to put it. Um, and that she's being recognized for all she did. Yeah, the fact that the, her alumni magazine <laughs> was what broke that story. I don't want to, you know, be down on alumni magazines, but I know that like my own alumni magazine, they wrote it, write a lot of very interesting features about the alumni and about the school, but I wouldn't necessarily ever expect them to break a big news story. Right. That's not where you go for hard scoop. (laughs) Right. (laughs) It's, um, that becomes really interesting in that a lot of the stories that are told about her, even today, like if you read about her on a, a kind of succinct, you know, site or in a, uh, you know, when she's a small part of a bigger, uh, collection of of essays or whatever in a book, a lot of the information you can trace right back to that alumni newsletter, which was amazing that they got that, but also maybe not the most nuanced, you know, journalism ever, um, not like the most hard fact-checking going on. So there is some stuff that you'll occasionally, there's a um, a PBS documentary about her, and I definitely got the impression from one of the the researchers who has written a lot about her that they interviewed that like it it, it was I think she may have even said something along the lines of like they they meant well yeah <laughs> uh, but it also in some ways you know kept some of the m- confusing parts of her story going um this is one of those t- topics too that because they were part of a spy network I mean it could be its own there could be an entire podcast series on right. the Red Orchestra and all of the members and how, you know, like Dodd's daughter's letters were where a lot of information came from at one point and and the various pieces of documentation revealed over the years. Um, and like the the writings of Schulze Boysen, um and his work, which is also just kind of mind-boggling to me. Um yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot. As anyone who studies World War II history, particularly uh, when you get into the espionage area, there is a lot to unravel and unpack always. So we, I try to just keep this very focused on Mildred and her path through all of it. Um, heartbreaking though it is. Although I do love everything you read, every family member, you know, like they have cousins that still kind of keep their memories alive and and do interviews about them. 
everyone always talks immediately about just how deeply in love these two people were and how mm-hmm. like they were in this together literally right up until the moment they were arrested and separated. They were always together, always working on this together. How Arvid was happy that they kind of got the facts wrong during the trial, that she was not really aware of what had been going on with his spy network, that he was like, okay, she'll be safe at least. They can, you know, sentence me to death, but I know Mildred will be all right. Of course, he was, that was not correct. But um, yeah, it's a, their, their love story is very sweet. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what we'll hang on to. Um, (laughs) it's such a sad place to leave it so I will say again how excited I am for our listener McKenna to do her Disney College program Mm -hmm. I hope she writes us a follow up and tells us how everything's going because I want to know I will buy her a meal next time I'm there if she wants because Mm -hmm. I just appreciate it and it makes me happy Thank you so much for spending time with us this week. We will be back here tomorrow with a classic and, of course, with a new episode on Monday. If you have actual days off, like a weekend ahead, we hope you have an absolutely swimming and restorative time and that it's wonderful. And if you don't have the the good fortune to have time off the next couple days, we hope that those days go as smoothly as possible for you and you sail through it with minimal grievance or annoyance. (laughs) We'll see you next week. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.